And now I would love and so excited to have on stage the one, the only, Angelique Kijo. So my name is Femi O.K. Okay. This is Angelique Kidjo. We are going to do something a little unusual, Angelique, is that as a group, Moderate the Panel is a group of all women moderators. And we thought it was unfair for just one of us to talk to you. So each of us has five minutes. And then when my five minutes is up, my fellow moderator will tap me on the shoulder and I will leave the stage and they will continue the interview. So I had better get started. And at the end of that, we are going to open it up, put the house lights up, and you get to talk to the Women Deliver delegates. Okay. I love this picture of you. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank God you're not showing my mosquito legs. <laughs> I was so skinny. Yuck. <laughs> so beautiful. You look mischievous. Always. <laughs> Tell us a story about when you were little where you got into so much trouble. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, growing up in a household with seven brothers, it's, uh, it's always a challenge when you're a little girl and you try to get your point across and everybody's talking. So I always have some mischievous idea to cut everybody off. While they shut up, as you say, I'm going to have something to say. And I start, brruh, 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 brruh. my father say, stop. Next, <laughs> and I'm like, no, I still have more to say. I mean, it's important to, um, to be raised with boys. It, it gives me the strength and the person that I am. And to be in a surrounding where basically you are allowed to be whoever you want to be, to speak up whenever you want to speak up. And my mosquito legs was always the insult I don't like. Mosquito leg or snake with no butt. It's me. <laughs> boys. What stage did you know exactly what you were going to do with your life? Well, I, I won't say I knew immediately what I wanted to do. I've always sung as much as I can remember. My father always used to say that I start singing before making phrases. Because my mom said that when she was pregnant with me, one of the aunties from the village would come in and she was desperate to have another girl, not more boys. And then she was singing to the belly, so I come up singing. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, I always wanted to be a human rights lawyer and because of many different things. Through music, I've learned when I was nine years old uh, the existence of slavery, and no one told me that in school. And then I was 15 when I heard about apartheid in South Africa and my world collapses. And I decided that I was going to do something for people to understand that you're not that different from each other. And uh, I went to... Uh, I spent three, three months, uh, a trimester at law, at law school in the university in Paris. And I just like, uh-uh. You, once you understand that most of the time law don't serve justice, I'm a justice person, that you can twist the law to put innocent people behind bar. And if you have money and you have the, a, a relationship, you walk away free. I said to myself, I can't leave you myself if I let an innocent person go to jail because of political reason or whatever it is. So I decided that that moment, my voice is going to be the unifying voice, the voice of the, the voiceless, and to be there um, not to entertain also, but to educate and bring people to see their own strength. There's something I see in your music that I've been following you since we were both much, much younger. And you've done something with your sound that is now more fusion. Um, and but taking the music of West Africa, your home, to around the world and fusing it. Is that part of your mission? Well, it's part of my mission because we are all Africans. Africa is the cradle of humanity. And without um, the music brought by the slave around the world, the music we have today will not exist. It. And I learned all of that when I was doing my trilogy of album, Twisting Back the Roots of Slavery Through Music. The first stop was in America, the second stop was in Brazil, and the third part of it was in, in the Caribbean, Cuba, and other places. And I could link, literally, 
rhythm back to a, a certain type of rhythm in some villages. I mean, it was amazing. It makes you humble to see that you know, the people that come from your continent have been dehumanized and they try to brainwash them, yet the culture survives. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next. Angelique, I'm Shahira Amin, and I'm going to talk to you about Batonga. Mm -hmm. So, you were one of the very few lucky girls in Benin to get an education, and the Batonga Foundation was your defiant response to those who said, girls have no business in being in the classroom. Mm -hmm. How did it all start? I think it all started with the dedication of my parents, my mom and dad. Both of them have been educated. And as a young girl, I, I, I took it for granted, basically. I thought it was the norm. And I would go to school, and then the next day, one of my girlfriends don't show up. And I'd be asking questions until it hit home when, with my, my best friend in the street where we grew up. I would just disappear out of the, the name. Where was she? And then I bugged my father to find out, and she actually had been married off. And I was pissed off. And I'm like, no, being married is not a job. It has to be a choice. We have to grow up to choose who we want to live with. As a child, no one, absolutely no one, not your father, not your mother, not your society have the right to decide upon your body, what you do with it, and your, your love. 13 years on, you're transforming the lives of girls one by one. And it's not just the girls, their families and their communities. So there's this ripple effect. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, I always say to people that um, if you want to help people, you have to respect the people. You have to respect the dignity, especially when you're working with poor people. The only thing they have left is the dignity. And you can come with good intention. And if you don't make them part of your program, you don't make them part of your commitment, you fail. Because we failed so long. When I started as a UNICEF Guril ambassador, I've heard so many young girls, so many parents telling me, we don't trust the white people anymore. They come here with their big car, and they think that we are dogs, and they throw a bone to. And I know exactly that feeling because I'm from Africa. And I know that words means a lot. More, words hurt more than somebody slapping you in the face. So when I start Batonga, I make sure that we reach out to the poorest of the poorest. As Alita, the member of the board said, we don't walk the paved road. We wanted to walk the dirt road to go to the, 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 the poorest, the, the farthest one, because the brain has no frontier. Identify the girls most in need. Because I work with um, local NGOs, I work always with people in the countries. I can't come in and say, I want this, I want this, I want this. I'm just going to pick up where my colleague left off. You are a recipient of numerous awards, but one that stands up for me is the Rockefeller Award. It was about building bridges in leadership. That's a very powerful symbol. What does it mean in the context of Women Deliver and our journey towards gender equality? What tools do we use to build these bridges? Well, I, um, I see people as equal to me all the time. And in that, I don't care about your skin color. It's what you have to bring to the table that allowed us to bring leadership to the forefront. And when we're talking about women leadership in the world, we need to talk to each other on respectful level. We have different views, probably. We have different opinions. But at the core of what we do, we want the other women to be strong. Mm -hmm. If you are strong, how do you make the other person strong? By talking. By talking and followed by action. I always say action, talk is cheap. Action is expensive. And I'm so tired of talking. People talk, talk, and then you turn around, nothing is happening. Mm. And I think that we here as Women Delivery, one of the things that I want to bring to the table here is that we need, in a year from now, all the organizations that are here that are going to talk, what we do, we need to gather together in a year and make a, a statement about what we have achieved. Because if we women want to make a change, we can't do that, guys. Mm -hmm. We see our power have to be different from men's power. Our yeah. power have to be informed with action. And we have the proof of what we do. Mm -hmm. Measurable deliverables. I mean, 
that's a very political position, but I can't help feeling that it's also personal for you. You talked about your mother when you started the conversation earlier. I want to go back there. You come from a family of boys. Your mother amplified her voice as, and stood up against cultural dictates and norms and decided that Angelique, my daughter, is going to go to school. I just want to know, where did you get the resilience as you walked to school and you were being taunted because your mother defied the norms, mm. but every day that you pitched for school, you were participating in that uh, defiance. Where did you get that strength? I get that strength not only from my mother, from my father too, because I mean, my father was a, one kind of a person. I mean, I gauge men based on my father, because my father always said to my mother, I'm your husband, I'm not speaking for you, I'm not deciding for you, because I marry you because I know you are able to take care of yourself and take care of me better than I can take care of myself. And my father have empowered us all. He stood against his own family. Every school year when they come to take us to get married, my father will say, my daughters, my children are not merchandises. But who give me the strength to stand and when I'm going to school and to walk tall till today is my grandmother, mm. my mother's mother. When I came back from school, I was 12. When boys were taunting me, spitting, throwing stone and sand at me, calling me prostitute because I was singing. When I started younger, it was okay. But when puberty, puberty kick in, there you are seen as mm. potential mother. And I came back home and I was like, I'm not singing anymore. My grandmother is from Nigeria. So she grabbed me, she cleaned me. She said, if you want me to help you, stop sobbing. Mm. Stop crying, speak up. So I told her what happened to me, and I said, and I'm not going to sing anymore. That was my conclusion. And she looked at me, and she said, in this house, aren't, being, are, aren't we all being supportive of yours? Mm. I said, yes. Do we ever question the fact that you sing? I said, no. She said, then what you care about people you don't know telling you who you're going to be? I love your granny. I love your granny. Last question. Talking about leadership attributes. The world is in turmoil right now, from Brexit to... Uh, okay, There I'm is gone. no last question. <laughs> I was taking a chance. You've got to do that, right? It may work. She's trying to push it. <laughs> Outrageous. Finally, you get her off. <laughs> Outrageous behaviour. What hope do you have for your daughter's generation as they attack the issue of climate change? I think they're going to be more um, efficient than us. Uh, I hate cell phone, but today with the cell phone, they can gather together very quickly and put the, the mind together. The millennial, as we call them, is a challenge to speak with my child. Because when you, you start a conversation with my child, she's already have 10 steps ahead of you. Mm -hmm. So you grab it. <laughs> she's already there. Say, Mom, I have been there. I'm like, OK, so now next. It's always challenging to speak to them, but they know very well that in order for them to have a future, they need to get involved in many issues as gender equality. My child is really aware of that, um, of climate change, and also of history. My child, when she arrived at mm -hmm. Yale, the first year, she found a job at library. She loves books. And they asked her to classify uh, the testimony of the uh, Holocaust survivor that they have in video in French, in English, by camp. She was 18 years old. As a mother, I'm like, <gasps> hell no, you can't do that. She said, mom, I know you are, you are afraid. But she said, I don't want anybody to play with my brain. Information is power. I want to know firsthand what has happened and to know what can be done for it not to happen ever again. Sounds like she's inherited a few of her mother's views, perhaps. Well, but man, I won't have the courage of doing that again. <laughs> I'm too sensitive. I mean, <laughs> I cry very easily. So um, you are a woman who has who has devoted just a phenomenal amount of energy to a huge amount of causes over the years. Um, as you look at the you know, mass of causes out there, how do you decide in any one year what is going to um, be worthy of your power and your voice? Well, you know what? You, us human beings, we are complex. There's nothing about us that is simple. Nature is complex. And you realize as you go along working, since I became a UNICEF Goodwin Ambassador working with little children, with adolescents, with mothers, that everything is linked. If the mother is not doing good, the baby can't do, be good. 
We take the issue of stunting. If the mother doesn't eat well when she's pregnant, the baby come out, it's stunted. It's like there's no issue that can be taken lightly. If you want, as a woman, to make a change, you have a global view of the world. The way you think have to be definitely different from the men's way of thinking. We are multitasking people, and we have the brain for it. And the way we have to do this as, a, as women is not only to be in the talk to talk, we got to do things. And everything we do have to be informed, have to have proof, and we have to be there spotless because power have the tendency of changing you. So me, from the get-go, my focus always when I wake up, when I go to bed, when I wake up, my focus is us as a human family. A human being, I always say, if a mother lost a child and is crying miles away, I'm crying too. Because it's, it, I cannot be indiff indifferent. It, I have never been able to be indifferent. I watch the TV and I'm just like crying, cringing, crying, and I have to do something about it. Wow. Is there anything you would tell your younger self if you had to do it all over again? I would start earlier. <laughs> <laughs> This is my sister from Benin. So if you start talking our language, don't be worried about it. I was, I was touring, I was in Canada, and I was playing in Edmonton. And after the concert, this, those are the women moments where I used to sign CD after. Now I don't do it anymore because I talk so much, the next day I don't have no more voice left. So I'm like, I ain't signing no more CDs. So now you guys want CDs, it's without asking me questions. <laughs> um, and as I was walking from the venue to the hall to sign, I saw a young girl walking with, um, uh, it's not crouches, those things that you, you walk with very barely, and then with, a, with, heel, with wheels, okay? A walker. A walker, and I went to her, I said, you wanna come on the front of the line? She said, no, I wanna be at the back. I'm like, I signed your CD now, you don't have to wait. She said, I wanna be on the back. So she, I, has like, I have like 150 people, that day was long, one of the longest signature I've ever done after a show. And then when the girl came, then she was sweating. Hmm. She was in sweat, and her brother was with her. With her. And I said, well, why did you wait that long? And she said to me, if I'm able to walk on this, it's due to your music. I said, well, you could have told me that and spare yourself the pain. She said, no, I am, I am in rehabilitation, and I have to walk to you to tell you how much your music has allowed me to get out of the bed because they were supposed to go on holiday with the parents, the brother and the sister and the, the parents. The car, they get into a car accident because the brother had work to do. He, he couldn't get out of the work, so he stayed. And then the parents died. She was the only one that was that badly hurt in the mm. car. So the brother was telling me, took on the, on the story saying, I beg her not to leave me alone because that's the only person that I have left in my family. And I would not reach her with my words until I bring your music and then she start answering to me. Mm -hmm. So if you have music, it's not me. I'm not saying I made that. It's the power of music that is embedded in my voice and in me that allow me to touch people beyond what I can do, my selfishness. I don't have selfishness. Mm -hmm. I'm not selfish at all. So. <laughs> Um, hello, Angelique. My name is Michael Basakiu. I'm a freelance commentator. I'm also a former UNICEF spokesperson. I salute your work. You're an incredible example to a lot of people. Um, I, um, as a former UNICEF spokesperson, my, I have to be honest with you, I'm heartbroken when I see what's happening to children around the world these oh. days. The bombing of the marketplace in Yemen last year, chemical attacks in Syria, kids being blown up by landmines in eastern Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems that that condemnation from world leaders just isn't there anymore. The kind of resolve to say th this is enough, schools or playgrounds or zones on tranquility, children need to be protected. Is that something of concern to you that, you know, with 2019 we should be a lot further along in terms of protecting the rights of children? Thank you. Oh yeah, it's a concern of mine not only regarding the children but regarding the state of the world. Um, I think that um, we adults and we people, we have more power than we think we do. 
by our silence, we have allowed governments around the world to become senseless, criminals, and above. And sitting and saying, I don't believe in the democracy anymore, and I don't want to vote anymore, doesn't serve the cause. You want change, go to the booth and work with the people that can hear you and advance the agenda. So my question is about how we show up for this work. Um, and often I am the only woman, also the only, insert title, marginalized, racialized, African, black mm. woman. I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah, at the table. And um, I find that I, stand, I tend to get really angry. And instead of being inclusive and bringing people with me, I start like kind of being angry black woman. And um, I just wonder how you've done it um, to evoke such change and to bring people with you who aren't necessarily on the same page and to do it so effectively. Thanks you know, frust frustration is healthy. Anger is healthy too. But if you put your anger into action, you become more powerful. Always ask yourself, what can I do at my level? Don't wait for others to do it for you. Especially when you're talking to people that are deaf to what you're saying because they cannot relate to what you're saying. Find another ways. My father always used to say, you hit the wall, go around the wall. Mm. There's many ways to do things and you can reach out to people that can help you mm. get rid of that anger and start something good. I always say, I said it before, talk is cheap, action is expensive. So if you want to get out of that frustration, you have to set a goal. What do you want to achieve? Even if it's one life you change, that life will change another one. It's not the number that matters. It's the quality of what you do with people. How you have respect the person you want to help, to bring that person to your level, and giving that person empowerment. For the person to say, now, I am me, and I know who I am, and I can do better. That is what you're going to do with that anger. I want you to turn that anger into positive thinking and positive actions. How has social media helped you in bridging the gap between your music and activism? Social network is good and bad at the same time. Social network has allowed me to, to bridge a gap between the Western audience and the African audience. So now I, I can reach out to the African all over the continent. Before it was not possible. You reach out to the public in Africa when you go there, go from country to country to go to do concert or to tour. But social network is a tool. It's not that that changed our life. It's a tool. As long as we understand that and we use that tool to bridge gaps, to bring everybody together at the table of telling the stories, have moderators, don't have just WWW empty stuff. If people talk there, what is the response to it? It's not because somebody posts a story that's gonna stay there, follow up that story, and see how that story is relevant in her community. You become an advocate of change once you post your story somewhere and you take it into where you come from. We gotta use the social network for the benefits of our humanity. We cannot allow the social network and the muggles that make money out of them take our, our humanity away from us, our emotional intelligence away from us. And this is what we are saying for social media. Please, let's stay human. It would be remiss of me to miss this opportunity because we are the United Nations of the world that to give African youth hope we also ask our comrades from the developed world, from the global north, to also agitate and put their leaders under pressure not to destabilize Africa politically or the global south politically, because that's what causes the problems. Whether it's about the cost of data, the cost of medicine or climate change, often it is the poor countries that are at the receiving end and the richer countries that are reaping the rewards. So let's work together. We put pressure on our governments, but you put pressure on your governments too, not to destabilize African societies. I would love you to give us a little taste, because what you do is remarkable. You take an audience, and whether they wanted to dance or not, 
whether they thought they came out to party or not, by the time they finished in one of your sessions, i.e. a concert, everybody is dancing. It's the music's power, not me. I don't do nothing. Shall we try it? Yeah, well, are you ready? Shall yeah. we try it? All right. So, you gotta sing along with the song. I'm saying it. So you all gonna sing at me. Ashe mama, ashe mama, Africa. It's coming. Me wena, are everybody debu? Africa, maybe say no way. Let's go, everybody, come on. Ashe mama, ashe mama, Africa. Mama, Africa, mama. I can't hear you, man. Canada, come on. Now, wait for the first. She's dancing out there. Okay, we dance without you, family. Come on here. She's dancing out there here. <laughs> you wanted to wear the high heels, right? <laughs> now you're gonna suffer. Come on, go girl, come on. Ooh. 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 